Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Wards of the King. This messed up marriage tradition comes from the Dark Ages, the medieval times, and during these times, since people were seen less as people and more as what they can provide, orphans who were wealthy female heiresses, as well as wealthy widows, all became wards of the king. That is dark in itself, but since marriage is all about money, the king used these people to his advantage. These women could be married off to the men of the court who wanted to increase their wealth and land, or a lord who would also be able to sell her marriage to the highest bidder in order to make up for the loss of income she would have provided. If one of these women went and married someone on her own accord, she would then lose the money that was rightfully hers. How absolutely backwards is that? In our number 9 spot today we have the Bridal Bouquet. The Bridal Bouquet is definitely a classic staple in western society now, but it wasn't always just a nice aesthetic touch. The idea of the Bridal Bouquet has a much different history. It is said that ancient Greek brides would often wear wreaths of mint and marigold meant to serve as an aphrodisiac for the newlyweds, but I want to take us over to the middle ages. During this time, things and people were filthy. The concept of hygiene didn't really exist in the way that it does now and this meant that people were usually pretty smelly. This is why it became tradition for brides walking down the aisle to carry a bouquet that was full of herbs like dill and garlic. The bouquet served as a sort of deodorant for the bride, and it also worked to ward off evil spirits. Sort of like an awesome two for one deal right there in one bouquet. Dill was also like a triple whammy because apparently it too is considered an aphrodisiac, so having some on hand post nuptials pre consummation was just the icing on the cake for the pair. In our number eight spot today, we have the bridal veil. There are a lot of historical wedding traditions that have to do with warding off evil spirits. People were really concerned about that back in the day. This is one of the major factors behind why the bridal veil was created. Back in Roman times, the veil was actually a red sheet called a flamnium, which was meant to look like fire so as to scare off any evil spirits that were lurking around. In Greece, the veil was often yellow for the same reason. Over time, the color changed, but the intent remained the same. It was worn as a sort of protection. In the end, another reason for the use of the veil was to assist in arranged marriages. What I mean by this is that back in the day, when marriage was simply more of a business exchange than anything, sometimes veils were used to hide the identity or appearance of the bride from the groom. Definitely not the most kind tradition there's ever been. In our number 7 spot today we have wedding rings. Both wedding and engagement rings are common in our society today, but this practice has been around for quite some time, although it used to mean a very different thing. The tradition of wedding ring exchange can be traced back to ancient Rome, but it wasn't an exchange that happened between partners at the wedding ceremony, and was instead something that was given by Roman men to the father of the bride as a symbol of his purchase. This practice later evolved into the bride being given a gold ring that she would wear, which was meant to symbolize the fact that the groom had placed his trust in her. He was trusting her with his property. As for the reason we wear rings on our fourth finger, well, rings have been worn on many fingers throughout history, but the reason why this finger was chosen was because it was believed that the fourth finger held a vein that led to the heart, which in Latin was called the vena amoris, or the vein of love. In our number 6 spot today we have the bridal auction. Ancient Mesopotamia had a slew of rules and customs regarding marriage. There's one thing that the Roman historian Herodotus recorded quite well. While many of his stories are largely unreliable, this is one ancient wedding custom that has thankfully been lost to time. The bridal auction was exactly what it sounds like. It was an annual market where young, available women were auctioned off to be married. Those who were considered more beautiful were auctioned off first, and those who were deemed less desirable were auctioned after, along with a quote, monetary compensation, which was said to make up for their appearance. Harsh. Some of the most wealthy men in the area would come to the auction to find the most attractive girl possible, but even some of the men without a bunch of money came to bid a bit later in the game. Number 5. Zinc Chlorine Coats This one's bad, man, but it was stopped before it became a trend, thank god. Picture this, it's Victorian London and you're but a humble city servant. Your job is to clean the streets. One night it begins to rain, as it is known to do in England. I hear it rains there a lot, I don't know. And the city provides these humble men with coats that have a zinc chloride layer in the fabric. It was supposed to protect against rain and, and wetness and whatnot. A lot of chemistry in this video, but... Some might already guess that this was a bad idea. Zinc chloride is not only corrosive, but water soluble. So, after a shift in the rain, a lot of these men came back with really nasty chemical burns. 
And no, they didn't have emergency showers like in Heisenberg's RV. They didn't have that. Or your high school chemistry class it was really bad. They stopped it immediately because that's really bad. Number four, asbestos fabrics. Chris will like this. He'll remember these. Picture this. It's 2004. It's Saturday afternoon and your dad just got finished watching an episode of Trucks. Nice. And now you have control over the TV remote. Saturday morning cartoons, here we come. I used to love the Kirby show. He's one of my favorites. I love that guy. But just before you change the channel, there's a commercial with an old man who looks very concerned. And he says, have you been affected by mesothelioma and or because of exposure to asbestos? Then you may be qualified for compensation. I believe it went something like that. Maybe I should call Saul Goodman. Where's he when you need him? All jokes aside, those commercials were not joking. They weren't joking around at all because it's been known asbestos was very harmful for a long time. So yeah, it was pretty bad. Victorian times were no different. Mostly using things to protect from heat or fire. And while it did do the job somewhat, it was very harmful for the lungs. And like the old man says in the commercial, it could be cancerous. Hence, mesotheliomia. I, can't, I said it right there. I said it the first time when I was impress impersonating him, and now I can't say it. Mesothelioma. There it is. Mesothelioma. Number three, radium makeup. Okay, sure. I'll give you that radiation and radioactive materials were pretty much being discovered and barely understood for the time. Okay, sure. It was new. Look at Madame Curie. Tragic story there. So when the very interesting radium was discovered, it got thrown into everything because yeah, why not? Radium makeup, radium watches. You name it, radium was in it. While at first exposure to radium, you'd be fine. Not too much to worry about. However, after years of direct physical contact on the skin, yikes, there's going to be a problem. It's radioactive. It's the reason why you shouldn't get too many x-rays. Not that it's radium, I'm just saying radiation in general is not good for you. Not much to explain in this one, except it was used and manufactured in women's makeup, and they used it. And I, I'm sorry, that's just, that's just rough. Number two, mercury hats. Mercury was nothing new in the medical field in Victorian times. It had been used in ancient China for a long time before that. And yes, it was poisonous. It was harmful to you. However, in Victorian times, some hats included mercury in their production process. Now, why is that so bad? Well, because mercury makes you go insane. Hence why they called it Mad Hatter's Disease. I could not think of a worse name for a disease. Now, not that it's a fashion point, but this was also readily used for treating syphilis at the time. So something that's readily available for the public and health would wind up in closed production. It makes sense. If there's a lot of it, sure, it makes a lot of sense. But it makes people go crazy. That's... Sorry, who's talking to me? What? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> joke, funny. Number one, cellulose nitrate. This one's crazy. As you can tell on this list, there's been a lot of clothes and fabrics mixed with some naughty chemicals. Naughty. Of course, this is years before OSHA or Wemyss, so it probably wouldn't happen today. However, this one takes the cake. When cotton, or a cotton-like product, is introduced to nitric acid, it forms cellulose nitrate, which is also known as flash cotton. Not because it takes its shirt off at an edgy concert, but because I can't cannot stress this enough how unstable and flammable it really is. Even the slightest heat source could set it off. There's even stories of people spontaneously combusting after being exposed to items made with such. The lights in the studio, they'd probably set it off. That's how, that's how sensitive it is. That's pretty crazy. <sighs> More sensitive than your first day to prom, you know what I'm saying? Number 10, the cholera belt. This is just so silly to me. While the Victorian era seems like a long, long time ago, it's really only like three to four people ago. So yeah, your, your grandparents or maybe even your great grandparents could have experienced a life like this. As we all know, disease was rampant back then and thank God we're a little less gross now, am I right? Well, cholera was quite the tummy bug going around back then, causing upset stomach, indigestion, and the Oregon Trail's favorite, diarrhea. Ooh, no thanks. So the people of Victorian times came up with something that, well, wasn't only functional, but fashionable too. Very nice. The cholera belt was a piece of red fabric that was to be wrapped around the belly to keep you warm. That's because people thought having a cold belly caused cholera. Because yeah, that's, that's, that definitely gives you cholera. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's what it does. It's not. It's a, it's a sickness. It's a virus. Number nine, Shields Arsenic Green. For some reason, green was all the rage back in Victorian times. I'm not sure why. I'm personally not a fan of green, but except for the green screen. We love that. I know you guys can't see that, but I love, I love the green screen. When I was a paint mixer, sometimes people would bring up the wildest colors for me to mix, and they weren't for art projects. They were for walls. 
It's so weird, but I digress. There was a common color back then called Shields Green. It was made in a lab by a spooky, scary Swedish guy named Shield. Huh, go figure. This color was used in everything dresses, fabric, paint, you name it. The trouble is, it was a compound of copper and arsenic. Therefore, it was toxic and caused a lot of harm. It also had links to cancer. For example, when Napoleon was banished to St. Helena, the walls of the house he was staying in were painted with shades of shield. Eee, that's not good. Pretty sure he died of stomach cancer too, so there's a connection there. Number eight, beetle dresses. Like I said, the green color was really in at the time, and there were other ways of achieving such a gorgeous glow besides using shield paint. Similar to how Cleopatra made her eyeliner, some dresses in Victorian times were made with pieces of beetle. Oof. I'm sure there are some folks out there who probably don't mind that, but for the rest of us that don't care for Halloween or My Chemical Romance and Tales from the Crypt Keeper, hard pass. Basically, any beetle or colorful bug that wings or I guess caprices was worth keeping was prepared and sewn into fabric. The finished product doesn't look like it came from creepy crawlies, it actually looks kind of good to be honest. Mind you, this is a time when a lot of things were still done by hand, so there's a little bit of love in each beetle you stitch, that's kind of nice. Mom, mom helped out with that one, that was nice. Number seven, wearing black for weeks. Losing a family member is tough, life can get hard. In Victorian times, passing away was a big deal. There was usually a big funeral, flowers, tears, everything, the whole works. The crazy part is, you were expected to wear black or mourning clothes, as they were called, thought to be an outward expression of one's emotions and feelings. However, it's not like that one funeral of the distant uncle you had, where as soon as you got home, you ripped off your suit and hopped on Call of Duty to see what your friends are doing. Oh, on the contrary, my ninja diffusing friends, because in Victorian times, your search and destroy matches would require you to wear those black mourning clothes for a long time, sometimes even weeks and months on end. Queen Victoria wore hers for years after her husband passed, and it was odd to see her in anything but black. That's a weird story. That's crazy. Number 6, Annaline Dye. In 1856, William Henry Perkin was trying to create an anti-malaria drug using aniline. After all, the British were spending an awful lot of time in foreign nations doing as the British do and needed a cure to keep doing what they do. Well, he did not find a cure for malaria, but he did discover it makes a very lovely dye that makes deep reds, purples, and black. You need that for the funerals. Naturally, this picked up a lot of steam and began to be used in everything from socks to shoe polish. Yeah, I know, right? Trouble is, once people got enough exposure to the clothing with aniline dyed, their skin would go red, itchy, inflamed, and was known for causing really bad headaches. That's because it would absorb to their skin and poison their blood. That sounds pretty Actually, I don't want, I want that. In our number five spot today, we have wedding baths. This is one of the most serious of all of the wedding traditions that were seen in ancient Greece, and it was a key part of the pre-wedding rituals for brides to be. This ritual bath involved water being carried in a special ceremonial vase called the lutrophore to the bride's chamber for this bathing practice. This ritual was actually so important to the people of the time that much of the time, should a young woman meet an untimely fate before being married, they would still perform this bathing ritual on the woman post-mortem. Sometimes they would even be buried with the ceremonial vase as well, even though they had never had the chance to marry. This ceremony was intended to purify the bride and also to enhance her ability to have children. It was seen as the most important milestone in a girl's journey from adolescence into adulthood. In our number four spot today, we have courtly love. So we've discussed a bit about how medieval marriages were mostly about the transferring of wealth and land and really didn't have much, if anything, to do with love. This would obviously be a less than ideal way of living, so to make things a little more bearable, there was the practice of courtly love. This, of course, was for members of the court and it allowed lords and ladies to experience love despite their marital status. This was actually a huge hit and so many people became involved that there ended up being a list of rules posted, one of which included the rule, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. The courtly love saw people doing things such as dancing and giggling, and if they really wanted to get a little risque, they'd even hold hands. 
sex, of course, was forbidden, however, because there are some boundaries while you're married, alright? It's just sad that people were in these loveless marriages and had to resort to things like this, all because they simply weren't allowed to marry for love. I am glad though that they were able to have some kind of freedom, I guess. In our number 3 spot today, we have double consanguinity. Double consanguinity is the case that comes up when there is consanguinity from two sources, meaning some sort of familial relationship from two places. This was important in medieval times because it was common for two siblings in one royal family to marry two siblings from another royal family. The children of these couples would be considered double first cousins. They would be allowed to marry as first cousins, but they technically had an even closer biological relationship than first cousins did. This might be a little strange to a lot of us now, based on most of our ways of living and the law, but these rules were formed before the concept of genetic relationships and DNA was even known, so there of course would seemingly be nothing wrong with it during those times in history. In our number 2 spot today we have the Viking party. Ok, we've all been to a wedding before where we maybe got a little too loose, had a little too much fun, but let me tell you right now, no one did it like the Vikings. An important aspect of a Viking wedding ceremony was mead. It was a legal requirement for the bride and groom to drink a specially brewed bride ale together at the feast that took place after the wedding ceremony. It was an important step in making sure that the marriage was a binding one. The happy couple would need to ensure that there was at least a month's worth of ale ready for the wedding day and it needed to be continually drunk throughout their honeymoon as well. The first serving of the bride ale was presented to the groom by his new wife in what was known as the loving cup. Before the groom takes his first sip, he would likely consecrate the ale to Thor by making the sign of a hammer over it and a toast to Odin, then he would sip the ale before passing the cup to his wife. She would then make a toast to Freya before having her sip and then it was officially party time. In our number 1 spot today we have purity. Of course women have been subject to the weird standards of purity for hundreds and hundreds of years, but it was so bad in the medieval times that it was very common for women to have to take a type of purity test in order to assure her new husband. We won't get into the multitude of reasons why that is both horrible and extremely bizarre because we would be here all day, but I will talk about this test that they felt necessary necessary to do. For royals, the wedding night was usually watched by observers, which is very weird, but in an even weirder turn of events, after the marriage was consummated, it was normal for the sheets to be checked for blood. For people who were lower class, they didn't usually have observers, but there was apparently a rule for these couples that would allow the local ruler to have sex with the bride on her wedding night before the groom. But this is debated by some historians, and I truly hope that this one is actually untrue. Number 10. Naughty Naughty. There's a reason we don't do things like we did in ye olde times. We didn't know, but now we do. So there's really no excuse for acting up. A very common practice for marriage back in ye olde times was to marry a girl at the age of 12. And in case you're wondering, no, the man was nowhere close to the same age. Yes, it's just as gross as you think. No, I'm not happy talking about it, but that's just the way things went. I can just imagine how happy those young ladies were when their parents came to them and said, listen, the lord across town fancies you and the dude's got the bag. So you're gonna marry him so mommy and daddy can get the bag too. That's just one example of the medieval business transaction. I mean, marriage. Marriage, marrying for love. <laughs> Number 9. Pull up a chair. The people of my generation either struggle to phone the doctor to make an appointment because of crippling anxiety, or they flaunt it on OnlyFans. There's no in between. However, I still think most people would feel uncomfortable finalizing their marriage in front of a party of witnesses. I honestly cannot think of a more awkward situation. Do you cheer them on? Are, are there sports commentators talking about the moves? Are there snacks? You could be there for 30 seconds, or 10 minutes depending on who you're watching. It just seems like a lot of unpleasant viewing to walk out of a room later to then all agree that yes, yes indeed, that couple is married now. But hey, that's just how it went. Witnesses or family would watch you do what animals do on the Discovery Channel. Number 8. The Birth Factory Soap and sanitation is one of the greatest things ever invented. Don't you just love taking a hot shower after a long day? Oh, I know I do. Hygiene was not the greatest back then, and while not the only factor, it did contribute to a high infant mortality rate. 
It was just one of the many factors. So, when young women were married, and married rather quickly, it was time to start pumping babies out. It's more of a quantity over quality kind of thing. Before marriage was declared a holy sacrament, these things were happening everywhere. Pubs, town squares, heck, even in your house. Now, for the people at home, can you tell me how you feel about the holy sanctity of marriage? Especially after you've been married for more than 10 years. Does it feel good? I bet it does. Number seven, wrapped up. One of the weirdest superstitions and traditions that still carries on today is that the bride cannot be seen by the groom before she walks down the aisle at the wedding. Why? Well, it's bad luck. After all, that could ruin a marriage. Not like any other factors would have a hand in that. Like in-laws from hell or spending way too much money on the wedding, putting you in crippling debt right as you're just about to start your life together, right? Well, this was the way of the medieval wedding, and something used to even keep things mysterious was for the bride to wear a veil. It was thought that it would protect her from evil spirits, but also keep her from being seen by the groom, which honestly sounds like it might have been worse. So when the groom got to unwrap his wife, if he didn't like it, well, sucks to suck, brother. Just imagine your bride walking down the aisle, and then... Yes, I will get married to you. Let's do it. Number six, Mr. Steal Yo Girl. This one's pretty messed up. I'm not even sure how this was even possible, but hey, here we go. So on your wedding night, it was the legal right of feudal lords to come on down to your place and shack up with your soon-to-be wife. What? Who most likely was a virgin? That's right, the government would come down and fornicate with your wife. Sounds just like the IRS. Anyway, this messed up tradition is somewhat shrouded in curiosity due to its extremely uncomfortable nature and its legitimacy. It may or may not have happened, or at least if it did, it might not have been as commonplace as some people may think. Moving forward, I think it's safe to say that this tradition can stay in the past, as there's no need for the mayor of my town to be sweet talking to my wife during the wedding. Hey, hey Mr. Mayor, you get your hands off of her. Number five, a toast. My favorite part of a wedding has to be the speeches or the toasts. They're always way too long or too personal or you know what, just too depressing. Just way too sad, just tears. You're like, why? Why are we talking about this? It's a nerve wracking part, even as a guest, just to get up randomly and be like, okay, look at me everyone, hi. No, I don't want to do that. Back in the 1800s though, only men were allowed to give these toasts. The oldest friend, the groom, the best man, and then the father of the bride. The whole thing would have been done in eight minutes. Guys suck at speeches. They're just like, uh, uh, a lot of ums, that's all I'm saying. Wedding toasts go back as far as the 6th century BC. When Greeks were getting married, the father of the bride would drink the first glass of wine just to make sure it wasn't poisoned or anything. Romans would also drop a piece of burnt toast into the wine in order to make the wine taste less bitter, hence the term toast. Yeah, now we get it. Yeah, wine was so bad back then, they had to use burnt toast crystal light just to get through the day. Yuck. At number four, transaction. I find it to be just a little bit messed up how before now, marriage was mostly about money or status and not about love. For a long time, people didn't get to choose who they got to marry and there was almost always some kind of monetary transaction involved in the wedding. This whole idea here is a reason for the traditional act of the bride's father walking her down the aisle and giving her away, so to speak. In the past, fathers of the bride and groom would come together to establish an agreement, like X amount of money money for someone's daughter or whatever. Once that was set up, the wedding became a big deal to see if the transaction would actually go through and many precautions were put in place to make sure that no one backed out. One of those precautions was the act of the father walking his daughter down the aisle. This was done so that they stayed close to one another in the off chance that the groom or his family decided to back out. That really took the romance and sparkle out of weddings now. Number three, wedding cake. As the youngest of three, I can confirm that we get away with the most. The youngest often do. The middle child is just plain ignored, and then the oldest, well, they usually have the most responsibility in the family. Usually when a bride and groom cut the cake on their big day, it's for them. They save a piece till their anniversary, they put it in their partner's face, it's fun, whatever they want to do. Often in history, the eldest child would get the first slice. How lucky is that? When it came down to cutting the actual cake too, well, that meant that the bride is no longer a virgin. It's an awkward few bites. Wedding cakes today are delicious and they're pretty much an art form. TV shows are devoted to them, like Cake Boss and other cake shows that I can't think of. If you're lucky, you might find a few cake charms on the inside as well back in the day. Real, non-edible cake charms. You wanted to find these in your cake. They brought good omens to the table. To find a rocking chair meant that you were going to live a long life. An anchor means you're bound for adventure, sailors ahoy. And a purse meant that you would have good fortune. Let's just hope you didn't find the charms with your teeth or else you would be using said new fortune fixing your chiclets. 
very metal, very real. <laughs> Not good. At number two, plague flowers. In a lot of weddings, the flowers are very important. There's the flowers for the centerpieces, the bouquets for the bride and bridesmaids. There's flowers everywhere. Get your Benadryl. But why is that? Well, the idea of carrying a bouquet at a wedding dates back to ancient Greece, where it was believed that carrying a bouquet was thought to ward off evil spirits. But a little later on down the line, the presence of bouquets at weddings got a little bit darker and a little more precautionary. During the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, when the Black Death was running rampant throughout Europe, people were trying anything and everything to try and ward off the plague. Back then, people believed that smells carried contagion, so people would fill their pockets with fragrant things to keep the plague at bay. This was later integrated into wedding practices and brides started carrying around a bouquet of stinky stuff like garlic and dill to protect them from catching anything. Over the years, the stinky stuff was replaced with nice smelling flowers, but really, no one cares what's in the bouquet anymore because all people want to do is participate in the wedding hunger games and fight to the death to catch the bouquet at the end of the night. Why? Why are we hurting each other for this? Why? And finally, number one, wedding rings. One ring to rule them all. Perhaps the most important piece of the wedding puzzle, rings. Whenever somebody is about to pop the question, everybody around them always needs to see the ring. Congrats, let me see the ring. Oh my God, is it this, is it this? Egyptian pharaohs first used rings to represent this eternal life. The circle has no beginning or ending. They created this concept that we adore to this day. The center of the ring was also believed to be the gateway to the unknown. Finger just disappears, you're like, what the f These Egyptian Ouroboros rings were the first, a snake eating its own tail, hashtag love. When Greeks came in the picture, they took this tradition, started using copper and iron rings in ceremonies, and the iron rings had a key symbol on them, meaning that the wife now has control of the house. If you like it, then you should have put a key on it. Come medieval times, the ring gets another upgrade. Now we have these precious gems to be added to them. A little bit more glam. Rubies symbolized passion, sapphires symbolized the heavens, and diamonds to show strength. Because they were rock hard and obviously you know the rest. Come the 12th century, the Christian church declared marriage as a holy sacrament, so rings were solely used now for that ceremony. That's when the engagement ring came into place. There needed to be another trade or promise that was just as strong as a wedding band. So now there's rings for pretty much everything. At number 10, veil. Through this video, you will come to find out that a lot of the wedding traditions that we practice these days have some pretty messed up origins. We'll get through a lot of them throughout this list, but let's start off by talking about the bride veil. These days a lot of brides choose to wear a veil on their wedding day. With so many different styles to choose from, this accessory is known to add that extra little pizzazz, little spice to the look. But throughout history, veils were used for different things, some of them being a tad bit messed up. Just a smidge. The rather obvious reason for brides to wear a veil back in the day had to do with religion and staying modest. But this hasn't been the only reason for veils. In ancient Rome, brides wore veils because it was believed to be effective at warding off evil spirits. The most messed up reason for the veil though, at least in my opinion anyway, has to do with the wedding transaction, so to speak. Since back in the olden days, marrying your daughter off was seen as more of a transaction, brides would wear veils to cover their faces and they wouldn't be lifted until after they were proclaimed husband and wife so that the groom wouldn't be able to back out if he didn't like how his bride looked. Seems pretty messed up to me, but what are your thoughts on it? Tell us down in the comments. Number nine, when doves cry. I've been to one wedding where they released doves, like actual real life doves, and I was like, do they actually do this? I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't know it was a real thing. Why do we do this? Well, because doves mate for life, and they build a nest, and then they Netflix and chill until the end of their dove days. Sounds like perfect symbolism if I've ever heard it. Back in ancient Roman and Greek times, doves were often used as gifts from the bride to the groom. Pretty shitty gift if you ask me. Here's a bird that we now have to both take care of. The snow white ring neck dove is used by magicians. They can't fly too well. They don't have a homing instinct. Whereas rock doves, the ones commonly used in weddings that we see fly away over Nana's head, they have a homing instinct for hundreds of miles. So they're perfect for the gig. But they couldn't be released during foul weather and they needed two hours before the sun sets in order for them to fly home. The wedding band has less rules than the doves. That's amazing. Their rider is much smaller. If you were to catch one of these doves at a wedding, you were also allowed to keep it back in the day. Also, great hands. I don't know who's catching birds or why they want to keep it and put it in their pocket, but 
You do you. At number eight, best man. These days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom, whether that's a brother or a best friend. But back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different and was all about protecting one's assets. Back then, bride napping was actually very common, so if there was someone else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to another person, they might try and steal her away for themselves. Yeah, why? I don't know. This is where the best man came in. The best man's job was to protect the bride and if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure that she didn't try and make a run for it herself. They really said, try to derail this wedding and see what happens. Number seven, a June wedding. As we're counting down this list slowly but surely, you've probably begun fantasizing maybe about your own wedding one day. Maybe it's a beach wedding, maybe it's themed like a winter wonderland. Doesn't that sound cozy? It's your big day, get creative. They say the best month to get married is June, and from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree with that. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must, not just a thing you wanted to do. See, June was the month of the god Juno. They protect women in life when it comes to marriage and childbirth, so if it's between that and like, I don't know, Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June, better omens for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then, so when majority of the population did finally you know, wash up at the end of May or beginning of June, that's often when it would happen. Everybody smelled nice, they felt good, and they wanted to celebrate. So it was perfect timing. Better get me while my pits smell good, you know? That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can quickly hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Maternity leave who? Never heard of her. At number six, hashtag twinning. You know how at weddings the bridesmaids are usually wearing matching outfits? Well, this tradition dates back centuries, though it has changed slightly over the years. Remember how I mentioned that people would sometimes try to kidnap the bride on her wedding day? Well, well, other than the best man and the groomsmen trying to play their part in protecting the bride from being taken, the bridesmaids also played a part in that too. The bridesmaids used to dress identically to the bride so that it would make it harder to spot her and therefore prevent anyone from kidnapping her. This practice dates all the way back to ancient Rome and feudal China and didn't really start to fade out of tradition until around the 1880s. These days you get a couple of gifts from the bride for being in her posse but back then you didn't get any Thing, and you had to risk your safety for your girl Becky, who doesn't even want to marry Jeff down the block. I don't know. Number five, Mamma Mia. The best man at your wedding was most likely the groom's best friend, who he most likely met in college and probably was part of his fraternity. And when given the mic to make a speech that was slightly inappropriate for younger audiences, the most common words of his vocabulary were probably bro and dude. All college friends put aside, the best man of the past had more of a greater responsibility than regaling the tale of the kegger at Stacy's house. Besides the feudal government coming to tickle your wife's fancy, there were others who wished to take the bride away, Bowser style. The best man's job was to prevent any of this from happening. Trying to get away with Koopa kidnapping meant the best man was going to do battle with you, or just make sure the bride is protected. Like, you know, trying to run away from an arranged marriage because women are treated like property. Basically, he's a Luigi to Mario, except everyone actually respects Luigi in this case. Number four, arranged marriages. All this stuff sounds awful, and you might be thinking, why do these women go along with this? Well, it's because they didn't have a choice. A lot of women simply didn't have the right to choose who they married. Kind of a rough time for the ladies. I would also hardly call these marriages marriages as it really was more the lines of something like a business deal or a proposal. Families promise daughters to others. Being basically sold off to someone probably isn't a good feeling. For wealthier families like royals, a lot of times it was just about wealth and power, but also about keeping alliances, keeping borders in check. Your daughter marries my prince, now we're allies. Oh, you've got a son? Great, because I've got a niece that just turned 13. Gross. Number three, marital disputes. I like to joke around in this channel. Ah, oh, hell, who am I kidding? I have to joke around all the time. But this is kind of a touchy subject. But it's the truth. Considering everything else that was going on, and it's not 
that far from the truth to say that women probably were not respected well inside the home either. This was a time long before equal rights and the resources that women today still need in case of domestic issues. I as an internet comedian cannot do the subject justice as it's something of a more sincere conversation to be had. However, I can talk about it from the medieval times. And some men just needed to be put in the naughty corner. Bad. Life was a lot harder for the average Joe back then, which means it was a lot tougher for the average Jane. Tough conditions don't excuse men treating women that way, but what I'm saying is it just wasn't a great time overall, especially for the women. Naughty, stay in the naughty corner, you bad medieval men, bad. Number two, mail order. This kind of goes without saying, but men basically just got to pick a wife. Using money, power, or because somebody just owes you a favor. You get to pick out a wife. It was basically like shopping for a new car. You look around, check your options. Remember, this is the time when women were treated as property. Perhaps the biggest divide between men and women back then is that while men treat marriages like business or political agreements, they are still looking for love, where for a woman, she just doesn't have that option. Sometimes marriages go bad, but can you imagine what it would be like to be in a marriage you didn't even want to be in from the start? Man, that's rough. Number one, married games. This one is just too weird not to mention. Divorces were not that common back then, till death do you part, and depending on if the church would even allow it, but however, in the yieldy times, in the land of Germany, there was a really, really messed up process called trial by combat, which basically meant when husbands and wives needed to work something out or separating, they fought for it, Hunger Games style. The man was placed in a hole to level the playing field, and the woman had a sack of rocks that she would use. Not that any married couple today would ever want to hit each other over the head with anything, right? Come on, that's not you guys. You guys love each other. And when this display of happy matrimony was finished and a winner was declared, the other had their light snuffed out. In a nutshell, the only way to divorce or remarry was if your spouse ceased to exist. So here's some weapons to deal with it. Go ahead. Here you go. Crazy. At number 10, watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage, and I'll get to that later. But later in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. On the night of the couple's wedding, they would do the good old brown chicken, brown cow, boom boom pow, <laughs> OMG wow, which could have been a positive or negative experience depending on circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching the live showing of Fifty Shades of Grey. And Joe would be like, yo bet, and then that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation so that the marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and Room and confirm that everything happened. Kinda kinky, kinda weird. Number nine, dowries. Today's weddings are in so insanely expensive. I don't know if it's ever gonna happen for me for that reason alone. But, uh, you know, they kind of replaced the dowry altogether. But what was a dowry? It was a set of assets, money, material, goods, real estate, that would be given to the groom once the couple united. The purpose of the dowry was to entice a groom to marry the bride if he wasn't already attracted to her. A kind of, we will pay you to marry our daughter kind of vibes. But it also acts as a kind of insurance for the bride. Should the marriage end in divorce, the husband is expected to pay it back. So yes, there were indeed take backsies if things got really bad. Though considering divorce and annulments were rare and the money really never belonged to her, not the best rule to live by, but the groom would also pay something called the bride price or bride wealth. The groom was expected to pay a sum, either in assets or money, to secure a lady's hand in marriage. This implied security for the bride and their family. But yes, in both accounts, technically, a bride could be bought and sold for whatever price the family slash groom deemed appropriate. So really just a marriage pawn. On number eight, shotgun wedding. Marriage and weddings back in the medieval ages were practiced very differently compared to today. Back then, people started getting married and having kids very, very young. Usually, girls would be married 
carried off as soon as they hit puberty, so around the age of 12, and they would start popping out as many spawn as possible because the high infant mortality rate made it very difficult to grow a family. On top of the duty to further the population, these marriages weren't for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or alliances, or because your dad owed Billy from down the block a favor and he offered you to his son Billy Jr. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriage wasn't as big of a fuss as it is now, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. You could get engaged in the morning and be married by lunchtime if you really wanted to. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies could be held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Number 7. No objections. So obviously, with a lot of people marrying willy nilly, a lot of marriages mostly made people miserable. Maybe. Enemies to Lovers is my favorite book trope, so who knows how spicy things actually got. I hate you, I love you, next day, I don't know. But the famous line, speak now or forever hold your peace, only got introduced in 1215 to try and flush out drama before they couldn't go back. In the Middle Ages, drama discovered after marriage vows were exchanged caused major problems since divorce wasn't easy or, you know, Accepted. We will get to that later. For instance, Joan of Kent, who was known for marrying Edward the Black Prince and mothering Richard II, had a secret marriage when she was 12 years old. She didn't get approved. In her early teens, she was married to an aristocrat, but the secret marriage was discovered after eight years. The papal court had to overturn it and return her to her knight. He died 11 years later, and it was after that that her cousin Edward married her. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that little detail before she married the aristocrat guy? Yeah, probably. Would have saved a lot of heartbreak. Hence why the speak now or forever hold your peace was introduced. At number six, shoes. Back in the days of old, shoes were apparently a huge staple in society. They were pointy and weird and expensive and complicated and were even integrated into marriage practices. During the wedding ceremony, it was a tradition for the father of the bride to take one of the bride's shoes and give it to the groom. The groom would then tap the bride on the head with the shoe in a token of his authority. But the shoe traditions don't stop at bopping people on the head like little bunny foo foo. You know how these days there's a tradition of throwing the bouquet at weddings, and apparently whoever catches it is the next to get married? Well, that tradition sort of came from the medieval tradition of throwing shoes at weddings. Instead of throwing flowers, brides would throw shoes at their bridesmaids to determine who was next to walk down the Aisle. Now this whole bride throwing things idea has failed me before because I caught a bouquet once and I'm as single as ever so maybe someone needs to chuck a shoe at me or something this time. Please. Number 5. The Bedroom Handbook Like previously said before, when you marry someone it's for life. You learn to love and you do the bedroom dance with that same person for the rest of your life. For some folks this was their first time and as we all know and remember that can be awkward. <sighs> well imagine if you had a booklet or an instruction manual on what to do when that time comes. Like a Lego manual. Although sometimes even those can be a little confusing. I always have to count the pieces. I get it confused. Well some churches back in the oldie times were doing such a thing. The Sume Confessorum as it was known to be called. It detailed exactly on what days were allowed to make the devil's dance possible. By the time all the rules were read and followed, you were boiled down to a small window about once a week or sometimes none at all. And especially not on Sundays. Ooh, you better not do that on Sunday, man. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's the wrong time to do it. Never do it on Sunday. Number four, Dragonborn? This is actually kind of cool. So in Viking and Norse weddings, there was a very unique tradition. We'll call it a tradition where the very handsome and brave groom would be tasked with a quest. Like something right out of Skyrim, actually. The groom was tasked with entering his family tomb and retrieving and or placing a ceremonial blade that acknowledges him tying the knot. Now, is that as cool as fighting off drogers and emptying literally every urn you see in search of golden amethyst? No, no it's not. However, I can't recommend entering anyone's grave before the invention of modern medicine. It's just not a great idea. But still cool nonetheless, hence it's on the list. Listen, I just got married. You own grandpa's tomb, go grab that knife, just go in there. Just go grab it, grab it smallpox. That's okay though. Go in there and grab it. No problem. You come out. <laughs> I got it. And anyway. Number three. Royal weddings. While poor class citizens did sometimes marry for love and support and to have someone to go through life with as being a woman on her own back then would prove to be quite difficult. Uh, sometimes difficult more than it should have been. Medieval times set a very troubling precedent for those at the top. A lot of times princes, princesses, kings, queens, 
and really anyone who held power or land were oftentimes married off to benefit that of a nation or a kingdom from which they came. In a nutshell, these marriages were political agreements, not holy matrimony, if you can call it that. Many times in history, nations swapped sons and daughters in order to save a little skin. Some marriages might go sour over time, but imagine one that you didn't want to be in from the start. Oof. And if you speak up, your whole kingdom might collapse. Yeah, not a good, not a good time, not a good scenario. Number two, witnesses. I've talked about it before, but it still doesn't make it any better or easier. Every person you see walking around today was created by a couple things: two people, a Barry White record, and a little bit of friction. Unless you're a test tube baby, sometimes like you're a clone in Camino, you know what I mean? And Star Wars, you know the, the big tube thing. Anyway, that's life. However, a lot of these moments are private, and they probably should be private, unless you're an exhibitionist or something. That's how you do things. Well, a lot of times for a marriage to become official, established members from your village or community would come and watch you consummate the marriage. Yes, that's right. Mom, dad, the bishop, heck, maybe even the grave digger down the road because he's got an important job. My question is, what do you say when that's happening? Do you cheer? Do you laugh? Do you... Way to go, kid. You, yeah, that's, that, that's my boy. I don't, what do you do? It's so gross and, ah. Close the door, Dad. Number one, divorce by trial. My personal favorite on this list, divorce by trial or divorce by combat. Either or, same thing. It's exactly what it sounds like. What if divorce court had a little less paper signing and a little more club swinging? Sprinkle in a little bit of Hunger Games and bam, boom, you got yourself a medieval divorce. It was a fight until you had to call Dompe the Gravedigger. The wife had a sling and a stone, the man had a club and was stuck in a hole ways deep just to even the odds. May the better, may the better spouse win. Whoever was left alive afterwards, got to be live free and then now they were divorced because the other spouse was no longer breathing. Who would've, who would've thought, who would've known? That's crazy. Number 10, divorce. Today, divorces can go either which way. Way one, it's a brutal, awful experience for everyone around you. Words are exchanged, property is fought over, and by the end, two lawyers are a couple grand richer and now the kids get to say dad's house and mom's house. Wow, sounds awful. Or it can be a more pleasant experience where both parties mutually agree it's no longer working out and they do their best to have a peaceful separation on everyone's behalf. <sighs> That's nice and it does happen sometimes. Well, medieval marriage and divorce looked a lot different. Who would have thought 800 years ago, who would have thought? The main part of divorce really was just being the annulment of the marriage, assuming it was allowed. Rules change depending on when and where it was. Whereas today, like my long-winded joke at the top of this segment, there's much to consider in a divorce, especially the estate. That's probably the main thing is, is the stuff. It's all about the stuff. The marriage itself is the least of people's worries today. But back then, it was just about just not being married anymore. I want the bricks in the house. Like, what are you gonna, in medieval times, what are you gonna fight over? Like, I want the cows, the cows is mine. Number nine, off with the head. Another way to solve the issue of divorce and marriage was to get rid of your spouse. The same way Polly Walnuts got rid of Mikey Palmis. Gabish. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Most famously, King Henry VIII dispatched a few of his wives as the church really gave him no other way out of the marriages he found himself in. So, you know, off with the head. However, I think it's important to note that King Henry wasn't the only bloated throne sitter to have his wives dealt with soprano style. Things weren't exactly fair for women back then, or at all. Least of all, the, the law. It didn't have everyone's best interest and justice in mind, especially women. So there was a good chance that if the king didn't like you, you were gone. Happened all over. Number eight, adultery. There you were, standing like a wallflower at your town's clubhouse. Ours was called the Lions Club. You know what I'm talking about, small towns. Wearing a little old thing your sister lent you. Cowboy boots clatter as the music gets quieter. Then a handsome young man wearing jeans all over took you by the hand. Oh, romantic. You've been together ever since. I'm sure I, I literally just nailed that for some people. That's pretty much how they're married now. Except now he's not as charming. Now he's got a beer gut and he farts in his sleep. Ugh. Oh well, that's married life. I'm sure the medieval people went through a very similar process. What am I getting at? Well, when you get married, it means you're with that person forever. That includes the bedroom. Well, kings and queens of yieldy times ignored that rule. Besides the obvious political reasons for marrying, which I'll get to later, what was the point of marrying for love if you're just gonna have 30 mistresses or a secret lover? 
I would list the kings and queens who partook in this, but it would simply be easier to list those that didn't partake in that. You know what I mean though? What's the point? What's the whole point of doing it if you're just gonna, yes, we'll love you together forever and then, how you doing? It just doesn't make any sense. Number seven, soldier on trial. Things weren't all bad for ladies back in medieval times. Sometimes they were given the benefit of the doubt. Like in medieval France, for example, where if a woman did desire a divorce, there was a non-violent way to get one. She and her husband would meet in front of a group for proceedings regarding their marital prowess in the bedroom. Of course, why else would I be talking about it? Meaning she had to prove that he could not prove himself a man in the bedroom. Happens to a lot of guys. In a nutshell, that means a group of people would handle, grab, stare, and examine a man's gabagool, piche deal, sausage, Woody the Woodpecker, the Olive Branch, the Edmund Fitzgerald, the Ballpark Hot Dog, the Ambassador, the Trombone, the One-Eyed Bob, and the Heat Seeking Trouser Rocket. That's a good <laughs> one. You guys get the point. It was a very embarrassing process, but if he couldn't produce results, Results in front of prying eyes, then, well, that means she's leaving. Can you imagine that? Number six, no Irish grandma. In society, we've decided that there are rules and laws and just rules that really just need to be followed in order to have an effective society. Like, no harming others or laws that help keep us safe. However, there's some laws that just don't need to be said. Some rules are self-explanatory, like no diving in shallow water. Yeah, that makes sense. You don't want to hurt yourself. No pooping in public. Of course not. I would never. I promise. And you can't marry your nan. That's right, you can't marry your nan. Yes, that's right. A law from medieval Ireland hits us with a marriage law stating that no man shall marry the wife of his granddad. You see, that's one you didn't have to tell us. We knew that. I knew that. Everybody knew that. Marriage laws were changing at the time because of English rule and a lot of other laws were changing too, but the close family nature of their marriages, well, things get a little confusing. It was just about the time. I'm not allowed to say in I don't think, but it was in that's what it was. So they, they were changing laws, but it was kind of gross. Ugh. Now I feel gross talking about it. Number five, the bedroom trial. So divorce, again, wasn't a thing. On the upside of dying early, it potentially meant that you weren't locked in a marriage for too long. If the marriage did end, it wasn't a divorce, it was an annulment, which was very expensive. A common reason this happened was due to consanguinity, which was close relations by blood or marriage, which was forbidden. Other grounds would be adultery, leprosy, and impotency. Also failure to concede to the marriage debt, which was the obligation for both spouses to engage sexually. It actually it didn't matter where this happened, you had to do it, even if it was in a church. It was a big deal. Enter the bedroom trial. Court cases from the 14th century show records that bedroom trials took place that would determine whether a marriage should continue. The bedroom part is exactly as it sounds. The man and the woman were placed in a bed together and were to be watched by the wise women for several nights. If over the course of the night the man's member remains of no use, i.e. impotence, then it was determined that the marriage should end. But the wise women were most likely either complete strangers or the groom's grandmother. So I doubt that would have helped with the getting it up part. Poor guys. At number four, marrying the country. If you married an entire country, does that count as polygamy? Are you technically married to everyone in the country or just the one country as a singular unit? These are the shower thoughts that I wish I could ask medieval queens, but unfortunately they died a long, long time ago along with their marriage secrets and probably some recipes for poison too. Back to this whole marrying the country idea though. Back in the medieval age, when someone became queen, they had to get married more than once. For them, it wasn't just about marrying their spouse, they also had to marry their country. This process was called consecration, and it was something that a ruler had to go through in order to be a legitimate queen. The queen would go through a symbolic marriage to the realm, complete with prayers and a blessing and a ring and a crown. It was essentially like a real wedding, except the groom was a nation of people. Sounds like a happy marriage to me. Yeah. Number three, the veil. As we have determined so far in our list, love wasn't the primary reason for marriage, especially for nobles. So as a result, there were quite a significant amount of arranged marriages. Besides the symbolism of humility and purity, it was also used as a way of disguising the bride entirely. The bride would often be wrapped from head to toe to protect her from evil spirits. This tradition goes all the way back to ancient Roman times. That's one explanation, but during arranged marriages, it was more literally used to hide the face of the bride from the groom. So if he didn't like what he saw after he literally unwrapped the package. Well, too bad, she's yours now. Eventually veils progressed to being much smaller, but the tradition of revealing the bride to the husband to declare ownership remained a tradition, even to this day, kind of, except now it's more romantically idealized. You see Priyanka Chopra's awesome veil and that, you know the one. 
At number two, long distance marriage. You know how during the pandemic, people started having Zoom weddings? Well, in a way, people have been doing something similar since the medieval ages. Back then, a lot of weddings were simply for political reasons, and so a big ceremony was rarely needed. So when two people from different kingdoms were getting married, they didn't necessarily need to be there for the wedding. Instead, they could send proxies and have someone marry their new spouse on their behalf. This would be the legal binding of marriage, you know, the paperwork side of things. But once both parties could finally meet in person, then they would hold a second ceremony with all the pomp and circumstance that you would expect. And yes, it still included the whole watching the consummation thing. Ew. This proxy marriage actually happened to Marie Antoinette and her brother was her proxy until she could get to the formal ceremony. So now we know that even back then, you didn't have to show up on time to your own wedding and you could just get someone else to do it. Sounds a little cold to me, but like I've said before, love is dead and it died a long time ago. Mic drop, thank you. Number one, last but not least, and this is the most messed up, the Lord's Rite. This one is definitely the most messed up tradition and I don't even know how it was justified in the first place. Like why was it even in place? Someone clearly clearly made this happen so they could piss people off. The last thing anyone wants at their wedding is someone interfering with the wedding night. As we know, people for the most part had to observe the ceremony, but the Lord's Rite was something even more horrific. The Droit de Seigneur was a feudal rite that existed in medieval Europe that gave the Lord of the land the right to sleep with the bride on the first night of the marriage. That's right, so most often they would take the bride's virginity. Now just how often this rite was carried through is debated, but if your lord had a particular vendetta against you, it wouldn't be surprising. This rite could also extend to a lord taking the virginity of every woman in the village. Even if they didn't want to get married, it was ridiculous. However, late Middle Age and Renaissance era texts don't clearly determine whether this practice ever occurred. Texts from 15th century Switzerland references the Lord of Mar demanding the right of the first knight or a hefty fee. So either you pay for it, or I do it. The Dwight de Seigneur was depicted in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which added to the infamy of the idea, but no physical evidence determines whether any lord actually did it, but it did technically exist. Gross. Number 10, Boy Jones. What's more intimate than a stalker? Am I right, ladies? If there's one thing women have loved throughout history, it's having every second of their privacy being watched by some creepy man, right? No, I can only imagine it's been worse since the dawn of smartphones and social media. I just, that must be horrible. Well, as it turns out, there were some real creep wads in the Victorian era too. The boy Jones was a stalker of Queen Victoria, who on multiple occasions snuck his way into Buckingham Palace, one time escaping with a pair of the Queen's underwear. What? Arrested multiple times, but still somehow found his way back to the palace. But what they should have done was swap the queen's underwear for a pair of mine after a shift in the garden center I used to work at. Oh yeah, nobody's coming for you after sniffing those bad boys. Oh! Number nine, graceful words. This was a time when ladies were supposed to be ladies, and that means manners are on the table and elbows are off. Dresses were worn to not show ankles, God forbid an ankle or wrist bust out. I think more importantly however, or rather unusual that is, is that women were expected to talk a certain way. Good evening Mr. Barrows, you must excuse my tardiness, there was a dreadful man screaming at me because my ankles were shown whilst mounting my carriage. Your what was showing love? Oh you hurdle, I can't believe it, excuse me, I must be someone else. I don't need to tell you guys how ridiculous that is. I say fly out the handle ladies, wear what you want, do what you want. Number 8, shots. Not the kind I like. Well, I don't know about you guys, but nothing ruins the mood for me and my lady like being fired upon. Yikes. I'd like to stay the night kid, but the automatic gunfire coming from outside is starting to get to me. See, all gangster impressions aside, things must have been that way for poor Queen Victoria as she was shot in her carriage in 1840. A young man fired two shots at her carriage. More attacks would actually follow in the coming years. It's kind of hard to feel that certain kind of way after bullets go grazing past your pretty face. The worst thing that ever happened to my generation was making sure nobody was home when you were studying with your boyfriend. I was too busy playing Call of Duty, but at least I never got actually shot at. You know what I mean? That's just a good thing. Number seven, expectations. All right, this one goes out to all the married ladies in the audience. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. 
I'm curious as to why you got married and what your expectations were. Did you marry your high school sweetheart and live happily ever after? Maybe you had a shotgun wedding and after one night at the saloon. Maybe you just really wanted to find a nice man and settle down, start a family, be a mother. I think any of those options are great, so as long as you have options. In Victorian England, you were expected to do the latter. Women were expected to get married and have kids, and that's about it, really. My question is, why were angles and wrists an issue, but giving birth isn't? What I mean is it's kind of a compromising position to be in. All I'm asking is that the girls get treated fairly and given choices and be allowed to show some ankle. This makes sense. You can look at her business down there, but you can't show an ankle. That doesn't make any sense. I'm a magician. Number six, double standard. Divorce sucks. It's no fun. The person you once loved and cherished is now the villain in your story. I love McDonald's and I don't ever want them to be the villain in my story. I love you guys. Gotta get those Happy Meals. Divorce is something that isn't new. Honestly, it was probably invented the second after marriage was. In Victorian times, men had the right to divorce their wife if they had committed adultery. Women could not. Well, if you refer to my last part, you know that men were doing more than a little window shopping when it came to women. When men left town for business, they would have hired the services of a woman who patrolled the streets at night. No, I'm not talking about Batwoman either. So men can divorce women if they dare to do what they did on a regular basis. Yeah, that's, that's totally fair, not, yeah, that's good, equal, absolutely, yeah. Number five, big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me, and it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no, commonly called self-pollution, which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is any man who wants to wax his carrot or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just as long as the bedroom doors close, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything. And if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it. Cause with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did. And I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad, so a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Cornflakes! by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works. I mean, 
go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, I'm not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching, so sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it, uh, had their toes curled, reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms, but that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Cause science. Number 10, no calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7-Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Pfft. Call on a man? No way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm a little lonely. Number nine, act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Oh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Oh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare women do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind. Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was, especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, that's just not very groovy, baby. Yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together, but given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women, like 11 to 16 age group, Oof. which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies and partying hard in the summer. 
I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five, emo girl. All the forever alone people, raise your hand. Let me hear you roar XD. I like to joke around a lot and say I'm a lawyer, a firefighter, and the cutest guy on the whole wide internet. But if there's one thing I know, it's people. I like people. I love them. I spend a lot of time with them, and after hearing this, I've come to the conclusion that this is where the emo girls come from. I figured it all out. It's down to a science. I'm a scientist now. Do you ever get that feeling in your tummy on Valentine's Day because you know it's going to be another one alone? And you'll be forced to be on your own, and, and, and that means sad music and crying in your room. Same, it's, it strikes Marvin room for me. Well, single women in Victorian times had similar issues. Since women were expected to marry and have kids, single women who were also forever alone were pitied by society, which I argue is just way worse. Who, who, no one wants to be pitied. Ugh. Number four, gold diggers. She take my money when I'm in need. As she try to... Okay, anyway, back to the actual content. Well, not exactly. While today in a place like sunny California, you might see an older man with a woman who's half his age. Maybe he's driving a nice car, or she's got on the very best and latest from Louis Vuitton. Stylish, yeah. Most of us think some thoughts about what we might think is going on there. We can kind of be judgmental sometimes when we see things like that. However, looking through a lens of 2022 to Victorian times might make the women of Victorian times appear to be gold diggers, but in reality, it was because all of their financials were tied to their husbands, legally too. Which, if you can imagine, that system didn't work too well. What if your husband is broke? What if your husband is running amok with sultry lasses on the street corners? Like I said before, no divorce, but even if she could leave him easily, supporting herself afterwards was going to be an issue, especially financially. Number three, birth factory. Just pump them out. The faster the better. Quantity over quality, or just, just get them out. The use of birth control, as you can tell, was not a common practice. Anyone who's over the age of 25, ask your grandparents how many brothers and sisters they have. I'm willing to bet it's in the six to eight range. Let me know in the comments below, I'm curious. A trend that would continue for a few decades after. Education is important, and I'll get to that in my next part. Women were simply expected to act this way. Maybe it was the sign of the times since the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Maybe the factories needed workers, I don't know. Which, in case you didn't know, they used children as employees. Maybe not so nice. Unfortunately, that was when there was an issue, and there were many. They had no HR to go to, and that was the least of their worries, really. Number two, no school for you. No higher education for women. Banned from going to university. I don't think so, not very nice, no, no. Honestly, any society that doesn't want half of their population to go to school probably has a few things to work out. It's a boys club and they can only go to university so that they can learn to be smarter and be businessmen, so they can earn money and thus have the facilities to court a woman who really doesn't have a choice anyway. Women had jobs, not careers. And they were all the jobs that you can think of. The ones that were too feminine for men as women were too feeble to participate in a men's job, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I'm happy to say that in 2022, we showed them wrong. Chetty loves everyone. Just remember that, I love everybody. You go, girls. Number one, strict rules. Okay, so after a night in the bed sheets with the gal that you love, 
or maybe the one that you found, there's a good chance that nine months later, a smaller version of you two could be walking around. A byproduct of intimacy, if you will. This was always something I wanted to rant about, but I always found it strange how strict parents and teachers from this time were with their kids. You gotta brush your hair, bed made, and whatever you do, don't ask for more gruel. Please sir, could I have some more? Whatever that Charles Dickens book was, I think it was Oliver Twist. They made us read those books as kids, and I don't know why, because they're kind of boring. From the extreme military code ethics happening at home to the long days in a factory at work, being a kid was tough, man. Earning the punk rock blues of today. I'm just a kid and my life is a nightmare. The Thames River's polluted. There's people asking for more porridge and everything's just really confusing. It's top 10 unusual Victorian fashion trends part two. Number 10, the hobble skirt. This is a bad idea written all over it. The hobble skirt, also jokingly called the speed limit skirt, was a dress with a very tight hem, making the poor lass who's wearing its movement, well, not having much of it. Can't have the wife running off from her home now. <laughs> Even if that, you know, that meant the home was not a good place and men acted really bad back then. But no, you can't have her running away. Apparently though, some were so tight that it caused women to fall. And in some extreme cases, I, I can't believe this, those falls were fatal. What? Number nine, muslin dresses. Honestly, I can see celebrities doing this today. Okay, so the female figure. It's sleek, it's curvy, it's gorgeous. Today a girl's got some options on how she wants to flaunt what her mama gave her. You go girls. But back then, well, not, not so much. Except for the muslin dress, apparently, which I find strange at the time, since seeing a woman's ankle could give a guy a stiff neck for hours, if you catch my drift. Essentially, this was a dress that you had to wet first, like a, a gentle misting, if you will. Yeah, weird, right? And then you'd wear it out. Now, for the summertime, this makes sense. And honestly, I might support this myself, actually. See the curves, stay cool. However, some stories tell us of women who wore this during cooler weather and then got sick. Fashion over function, ladies. Be careful. That's a silly one. Oh, 40 below, I better wear my muslin dress. Yes, I'm just gonna walk out. <laughs> Number eight, ladies wear. Okay, this is a general one, but ladies dresses and wear in general was just ridiculous. I mean, I mean those big poofy dresses, it just seems like ladies had it rough. When have they not? Wear a dress that's too tight or so big you struggle to walk around. Not to mention the fancies of dresses have wire, wood cages and frames. Just making walking around more difficult because yeah, that makes sense. For me, anytime I wear formal wear, I keep an eye out for bathrooms. You never know when you need to go. However, I just can't imagine trying to squeeze the lemon on those bad boys. Whew, that would be difficult. To make matters worse, there are stories of women wearing just regular big poopy dresses and then getting in accidents at factories. And yes, it was gruesome. And yes, they didn't make it out. And no, there's no movies about it, stop asking. Number seven, pestilence fabrics. Last time I was talking about the Victorian era, I mentioned a few points on fabrics with harmful and dangerous chemicals, which happened more than it should have. It shouldn't happen at all, really. It's kind of sad. Well, that wasn't the only fabric-related issue that was out to get you back then. For example, wealthy people couldn't be bothered to do their own laundry. I hate doing laundry, I don't blame you. I'm not wealthy, though. And sometimes would have them washed and taken away by launders who, well, wash clothes the rest of the city. Being that clothes and washers themselves were poor, or that clothes were just mixed around regardless, well, that was an issue. There was a lot of sickness going around at the time, and, well, it was contagious. A lot of times, these sicknesses would cling to fabrics, and when given back to their customers, well, they could very well come down whatever London was feeling at the time. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun. I, I, I think I'll just wear more of my dirty stuff. I'll just wear my underwear for six months straight. It was white when I bought it, not anymore, but it's okay. Number six, lead. Here we go again. Lead, just lead in general. It was used in so much stuff. Seriously, it, it, it's scary. Especially because they knew it was harmful. It wasn't a secret, they knew. Uh, I was gonna pick one leaded item, but I, I mean, I couldn't. I mean, seriously, I know this is a list about fashion, but it was involved in some clothes making processes. It was, it was in women's makeup, which that's also fashion. And it was in house paint, which I know that's not technically fashion, but it kinda is. Trust me, I used to mix paint before I was an internet comedian. I know the history of paint. Ask me your paint related questions in the comments below. I'm the guy you need to talk to. I mean, it was used in pipes too, and we drank out of those, it's just crazy. Now, it is one of those things that minor exposure to is fine, sure, but the thing was with fashion and beauty is that you probably would use said product every day, like the clothing or the makeup, and especially the makeup of the ladies. Lead poisoning symptoms include 
headaches, stomach pain, constipation, infertility, and memory loss. Yikes, that's not fun. We don't like that here. Number five, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally, it flourished, especially in major cities. And if you knew knew where to go and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's, yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so. Uh. Number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial on a liver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now, we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victoria London or maybe some B-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias. Some say it was Prince Albert. There's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least, and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there, ladies. Just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old blight herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband, who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic. That's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that when next time, boy. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror, the absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? Ah, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Number 10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era, and who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more, we need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. 
And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible. Because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling, yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, diet. Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number nine and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over the corner looks pretty lonely and Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends, now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend, oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night. Number five, corsets. Nobody wants a waist bigger than nine inches, said everybody in Victorian times. I for one can appreciate the female form and the hourglass figure. It's admirable, sure, but that being said, I, I don't think we need to go so far to keep the female form in shape. The corset's a little too much. Corsets were those chest tightening, gut sunking, push all to mince meat to the top of the pie, apparel that went under every woman's dress or every fat dude in his 50s who wants to feel 29 again. I don't think I have to tell you why this is bad or uncomfortable. The human chest needs to breathe and when something's that tight around you, well, you struggle to breathe. Uh, trouble breathing, fainting were not all too rare, especially in hot and humid climates. For my generation, you may recall Elizabeth Swan had issue with hers in Pirates of the Caribbean. And then she fell, and then Jack Sparrow caught her, and it was a good movie. But don't, the corsets, I just, I can't get behind them. Number four, foot binding. While not exclusively done in the Victorian era, it was started in ancient times and continued all the way up until the 20th century, thus includes the Victorian era. A Chinese fashion tradition that takes women's feet and binds them and squeezes them until they begin to change shape. Oh, poor ladies. Again, I don't think I need to tell you that forcibly changing bone and muscle structure in your feet just for fashion 
is a bad idea. I think you all know that. For starters, it doesn't look right. After years of binding, the shape of the foot drastically changes. Secondly, the health risk of doing such is not worth it. Oftentimes, toenails fall off or become infected. Ugh, gross. Bones break and pierce skin. It's a bad time all around. Thank God we stopped doing that, right? Jeez. Oh, thanks. Number three, lard wigs. Wigs have been around for a long time. If you're a fancy politician from Washington, you wear a powdered wig, singing Yankee Doodle Dandy all the way to the Capitol building. Balding men, women, or really anyone can wear a wig. It's, it's really for everyone. What I'm getting at is it's been around for a long time and we've come a long way. Given enough time and asked to tell the difference, I probably couldn't. I, I, really, I really couldn't point out a wig if, if you showed me. So we're getting really good at it these days. That being said, in the Victorian times, wigs were quite common and were fashioned with a peculiar substance. Lard, yes. Imagine every day of the week without proper baths or showers and living in close proximity to the Thames River. And you take a handful of pig lard and just slather that in your wig to style it. Put a gross sound effect in there, just gross sound, ugh. Do you imagine the smell? This is the most offensive hair crime since frosted tips in the early 2000s. Those were a big mistake too, I gotta say. Not, I had them, but it was. there's only one man who can pull that off. And he's in Flavortown, you know what I'm talking about. Number two, German helmets. 1914 was the end of the Victorian era and the beginning of the modern era. It's actually a very fascinating time. It's kind of like modern meeting the past, really cool. Well, fashion just doesn't mean civilian. Anyone who's ever spent time in the Marine Corps knows that they gotta look their best. Wah, well, Marines. The Empire of Germany was no different in 1914, and a lot of German soldiers wore helmets with an ornamental spike, like a Koopa from Super Mario. I know you guys have seen the movies, you, you, you've seen them. Except the main issue here wasn't an overweight Italian plumber jumping on their heads, uh, but the war and the enemy itself. World War I was fought in a lot of trenches, so it's kind of awkward when you can see a bunch of little spikes moving up and around the enemy's trench. It's also kind of dangerous to have an extra piece on your helmet as you can get caught in weird places like barbed wire. And yes, if you're wondering, sometimes they were used in the absence of a good melee tool. Yeah, you'd be correct, sometimes they did. You gotta do what you gotta do. Oh, brutal. Number one, French uniforms. More World War I, but it's still Victorian. It counts, I promise. While the spiked helmets were a very bad idea, they were shortly phased out. They learned their lesson. However, the French stood up and said, no, 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 I have a worse idea. Also, shout out to France. You guys get a bad rap for the war, but it's really your war. You guys rocked it, man. You guys are the best. Love France. Anyway, the French uniforms were a little bit of a mistake. In a classic case of fashion over function, kind of the theme of this list, they wore very bright and blue red uniforms. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but bright blue doesn't exactly blend into an environment, thus it made French soldiers a very easy target. Everything's like gray, black, and brown, and you're just wearing bright blue and red pants? Yeah, you're gonna, you're not gonna make it far, Chief. 